Now, there's one other place that we might theoretically have put a squiggle, although maybe it's not going to work. But what's the other place that we might have thought of as putting the squiggle here? What's the other bond that we might have thought might be formed here? Between the carbon and the oxygen. Maybe between oxygen. the number two and the oxygen. Well, as practice, let's draw what the alkyl oxide and halo alkene would have been if this is the bond that's being formed. So suppose that this was the bond that's formed in our synthesis over here. So I'll go ahead and erase this squiggle now, maybe, so we don't get confused by that. What would the original alkoxide and haloalkane have looked like that would have formed this bond? We're not sure this was going to work yet, but just as a thought process, let's write down what would the alkoxide and the haloalkane have to have been. And again, if we use the numbers, it shouldn't be that shouldn't be that difficult to figure out what those fragments must have been originally. It's always helpful if we try to draw our starting materials to look as much like the product as possible. So in this case, I shifted the halo alkene to be on the left-hand side, because this fragment was on the left-hand side of the product. And again, if we use the numbers, it shouldn't be too hard to come up with the right fragments here. Looking at the numbers, well, we know that with this squiggle, the original alkoxide must have been the O5 mm -hmm. combination. And that means the halogen must have been attached to the number two. Mm -hmm. Now we have to decide which or whether both or either of these would work to actually get us the right reaction here. Well. What, would this actually give us the SN2 reaction that we need? Yes. Would this give us the SN2 reaction? No. Now, why wouldn't this give us SN2? Because uh, the halo alkane is, uh, the alpha carbon is tertiary. Good. Maybe you saw that all along, and maybe that's why you were just focusing on this at the beginning. Good. So this would actually, even though theoretically it seems to have worked, it seems like it would work, now we need to reject this approach, because this would really give us an E2. This would really give us an E2, because it has a tertiary alpha carbon. It turns out that there's really only one reasonable Williamson ether synthesis here. The only reasonable Williamson ether synthesis here is with these fragments. Well, this is the technique of retrosynthesis. Retrosynthesis just means looking at the product and asking what would be some good starting materials for forming that product. Again, we can use the squiggles to indicate the bond that we might be trying to form. Sometimes there's many different possible paths that you might think about for forming the product, and then you have to go through each of those and ask which are reasonable and which are not reasonable. Now remember that maybe the way your instructor might have written this then would be like this. Your instructor would probably like to use the retrosynthesis arrow and put the starting materials on the right. And if you want to, it's perfectly fine to write this as your final answer. Mm -hmm. But for thinking it through, it's much clearer, I think, to use a regular yield arrow and put the products on the right and the starting materials on the left, because that's what we're used to thinking about. Can you think of any strong acids? Do you remember any strong acids from general chemistry? Here's three very important strong acids for organic chemistry. Notice that these are all, these are all, what do you call it? 
hydrohalogenic acids. They're all halo acids. These are all halo acids because they've got all get halogens. It's useful to notice, though, that hydrofluoric acid is not in this list. Hydrofluoric is not a strong acid, so hydrofluoric doesn't go in this list. We don't really use fluorine very much in organic chemistry. Another strong acid that we use a lot in organic chemistry is sulfuric acid. Another strong acid that comes up a lot in general chemistry is nitric acid, but maybe I'm not going to bother writing that because we don't use that much in organic chemistry. In organic chemistry, these are the four strong acids that are used a lot. Now the crucial thing is, anytime your starting materials have a strong acid, the first step should be very easy. Any, uh, well, what, what do acids do? We were reviewing a little while ago, what, what do acids and bases like to do? Well, what do acids do? Uh, they, um, they, like to, uh, they like to gain electrons, lose protons. That's right. Let's focus on that proton definition. Acids like to donate protons. Well, I was saying that anytime you have a strong acid, the first step is easy because the acid will definitely give its proton to somebody. There's almost no exceptions in organic chemistry. If you see a strong acid as your starting material, you know almost for sure that the first step has to be the strong acid giving its proton to somebody. And who's it going to give the proton to? Well, you'll, you'll see a couple of different patterns, but usually it likes to protonate somebody with a lone pair, usually an electronegative atom, especially an oxygen. So, the acid is going to look for somebody to give its proton to an electronegative atom with a lone pair, especially an oxygen, is the most common pattern. If we see one of these strong acids, then we know what we have to do first is give the proton to somebody. We were talking earlier about how important acid-base chemistry is going to be for the whole course. This is one example of that. We have to watch out for these strong acids, and when we see them, we have to start by protonating somebody. Let's see if we can predict the mechanism for this reaction. Any idea what would happen first here? Um, the bromine's going to take back its electron, right? Where it's going to give up its, uh, its proton. It's going to donate the proton. That's right. We have a strong acid. So we know that the acid has to start by giving the proton to somebody. Which atom do you think is going to get protonated here? Uh, the oxygen. That's right. Oxygen, we know, is a classic atom to receive a proton from an acid. But we have to be able to draw the mechanism for that. Sometimes that gives people difficulty, although that's a pretty simple mechanism, but it can give people difficulty. Let's see if we can draw the electron pushing arrows that would show what happens when this oxygen gains the proton. That looks good. Only one problem there. Since this oxygen is neutral, lone you have pair. to draw in the lone pair. lone pair. But you avoided the important mistake It's very common for people to write the arrow like this. This is a very common mistake because people get confused and they think that the arrow is supposed to show the movement of the hydrogen. But it's not supposed to show the movement of the hydrogen, it's supposed to show the movement of these electrons. So it's good that you avoided that mistake. The arrow that usually was correct, the electrons are going from the oxygen to the hydrogen. And then this bromine is a leaving group. Well now if we obey the arrows, we should be able to draw the intermediates. Let's try to draw the intermediates from that step. Good. It looks like you just worked out the formal charge in this oxygen? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. However, there's a much easier way to figure out the charge in this oxygen. We don't need to work out the formal charge. 
how, how we talk about this idea that anytime you do any step of any mechanism, you're always going to change two charges, at the initial tail and at the final head. Well, which atom here was at the initial tail? The, uh, the oxygen atom. That's right. And what charge did it start with? Neutral. Neutral. And is it gaining or losing electrons? It's losing electrons. So it must become positive. That's much faster and more reliable than going back to first principles and calculating the formal charge. So this is another great example of how the arrows tell us exactly what to do. That's how we know that the charge in this bromine is negative, because it started neutral and it's gaining electrons. The arrows tell us pretty easily how to change the charges at the initial tail and the final head. We don't need to go back and calculate the formal charges, although that might be a good check.